What does a successful relationship involve? How is it repaired when it goes wrong? How do we teach these fundamental things? So by having a digital baby that looks like a real baby and is responding in these human-like ways, it now gives us a way to really explore those types of human dyadic interactions in a way which has never been possible before. Stand by, I'll be right there. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 357. Today is Sunday, the 26th of January, 2020. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. Let me say how very grateful I am for your choosing to take the time out of your busy day to listen to this episode. And I'd also like to give a shout out and thanks for putting up a review of the show to Mother of Three. So this week's interview is with Dr. Mark Sagar. Mark's a double Academy Award winner and he's also the CEO and co-founder of Soul Machines. He's also director of the Laboratory for Animate Technologies at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. With his team, Mark is looking to bring technology to life, pioneering in the creation of autonomously animated virtual humans. In this conversation with Mark, we discuss people's relationship with machines, the challenges of making emotions appear in a machine. We explore the way forward in AI and some of the stumbling blocks of sentient artificial intelligence. Mark Cigar, so great to have you on the show. I had a chance to listen to you at COGX last year, the wonderful AI convention in London, and you were presenting Baby X on stage and, and directly talking with it. It was absolutely marvelous what you're trying to do. And of course, there's much more to it and what you've been doing in your past. So in your own words, Mark, how would you like to describe yourself? Um, I've never wanted to fit in any particular box, actually. So, um, so it's it's I I like taking a holistic approach to two things and integrating different aspects. You know, aspects of art and science and humanities and putting those together. So, I guess I see myself as a uh, an integrator of, of those things. Mm, beautiful. Well, so in, in that you are working on making, I would, I would call it sentient machines or machines that appear to feel and reflect our emotions. I hope that's a correct expression. You've done you know, amazing things for film as well. But what do you make of people's relationship with machines? There was a study just to preface that with that came out recently that said that 64% of employees at work in some 20 countries trust their a machine more than their managers. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, our relationships with machines. So there's many, many aspects to that because I guess um, with what you said there, you're talking about reliability and predictability, which is a huge component of trust. It's like, can I trust this person to, um, you know, act or respond in a particular way? And in our lives, in our human relationships, we we build that up over time. And then with the machine, um, if it's a calculator, for example, and it um, actually, this is a real example for me. So, uh, if I have a handheld calculator, I actually trust it. It seems to do the right thing every time I type in the numbers right. If I use the calculator on the um, on the uh, the you know the Mac OS calculator, every now and then it does some strange things which I don't predict. So, I actually don't trust that calculator because I don't know whether I'm typing in things wrong. It's catching the mouse click at the wrong time. But for whatever reason, I normally do calculations twice on it. And so that's just a very simple example of me not trusting um, whatever that entire interface is. So consistency is, is, is really that. And then I think the other thing that um, in human relationships, um, which will be different from a, you know, interacting with a calculator, is that humans have intents. And so so we, we may not be 
we, we may not understand the immediate reason why somebody may be doing something, but if we trust that their intent is good, we will be fine with it because we know that the general sort of force of what they're trying to do is going in the right overall direction. So that's why you wouldn't want to micromanage people, for example, because as long as that there's a trust in the intent of what's going on, then, you know, you're, it's, it's good for everybody because you're, you know, you're, you know, everybody's so creative in their different ways. I mean, why would you want to constrain that? So, um, uh, so, so yeah. One of the things that's interesting is that behind the machine is a person. And so it seems that people make abstraction of the inputs, not to mention the intentions of the person who they don't even know created the machine. Well, there's, it depends what it is. Like, for example, um, if somebody's built a calculator again, then, you know, this is a very um, uh, logical device. It's supposed to be reliable. And so the intent of the creator of the calculator wouldn't come into it. Um, if you have something a little bit more complex and social, like let's talk about Facebook, for example, um, then the driving force of what's going on in that is something that we become suspicious about because we may realize, oh, no, this is supposed to promote advertising. So we're being manipulated in order to create more clicks, in order to create more dollars. And so, so then the essential business intent of that is the thing that we're not trusting. And so I think that, you know, this is this whole thing about explainable AI and transparent AI. Mm -hmm. And what is the, everybody wants to know what's the intent of the system that they're using. Now, that intent, like you could argue, that Facebook becoming an echo chamber for hate speech and things like that was not an original intent of the system. However, the design led to that. Now, you, but you can argue that, you know, for, for the companies basically putting advertising revenue as part of their business model, that was a clear intent that they put on there. And, and so, um, you know, there's these unintended ones which the human behind it, you know, there's trust. That's not a, that's, you have to trust that they were thoughtful enough to figure out the consequences of all these things. But essentially when you're anything dealing with humans is inherently a chaotic system and therefore unpredictable. So, um, so, so I think that uh, in, in any human relationship, um, the most successful human relationships are ones where there's constant reparation going on. It's like, it's like there's a constant monitoring of is this working for the part, all, all the parties, and, and it's sort of fixing it when things are going wrong. And so it's adapting and it's moving. Now, if, say, you know, people, um, you know, want to stay in a relationship, then they will do what they can to fix it. Um, if that will is not there, then it will just diverge. And so, you know, because we live in these, these, you know, essentially a, a, a world, you know, it's a big dynamic system in a way. It's, it's constantly moving in ways which is very, very hard for us to predict and control. And so we're just trying to steer things, steer things all the time. Now, if the intent of the developer of a AI system is to make it something that is steerable like that, then it's probably a good thing because it's really you're trying to configure it for what works for the relationship. What 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 is it that inspires you to work on Baby X? This project which essentially is making a a baby that has a full range of emotions, the ability to learn as it goes, and is looking as real as can be. I mean, there's a, an enormous amount of verisimilitude in the way Baby X's face is working. Tell us the motivation you have behind that. So the motivation is, is really um, at, at its core. It's, it's a philosophical, it's wanting to understand more about human nature. So, um, you know, for me personally, I like to understand things by building models of them because that's the way that I can understand because you can have very theoretical ideas, like in lots of philosophy books, 
but because the real systems are actually the complex interaction of many parts, it's very hard to take a uh, an idea which might be a few sentences in a in a in a in a theoretical idea, but then actually see how that plays out in the actual world of complex interaction. And to me, I mean, in a way, it's also a way to explore the complexities of life. So, so it's like you know, everybody is fascinated by exist. Well, not everybody, but most people are fascinated by existence. It's like all the deep fundamental questions. Um, Every movie that we go to see is an emotional experience. There's all kinds of, you know, problems and situations which are getting resolved. And we're really interested in the interplay of how all those things go together. And so, so on that level, it's like, well, how, how do these things all work? And so if you can build a model of those, even if it's very, very simple, um, you know, baby X is completely simple compared to the real thing. We don't even know how the real thing works, you know. So it's like a, um, however, it's a, what I'm trying to do with that is it's like supposed to be a large functioning sketch. It's a sketch of sort of current ideas. How do these things fit together? And, and, and when you put them together, do certain principles fall out of that do, uh, certain insights fall out of that so i guess that's what i'm trying to do mm. on on that particular journey and in that is, is you know it's exploring like what is the nature of emotion so for example if you put a you know essentially build a model of emotion into a computer then what insights do we actually gain about the functioning of that so for example you know what i think is that i think emotion is a huge part of cognition. I think emotion has actually got a a, um, uh, a real effect in the way that we think. I think it's part of intelligence. So people will normally split rationality and emotion into two categories. I actually think they're incredibly intertwined, and that's actually why we're so good at what we do. So so there's things like that. How do those interplay? You know, and you know when we start moving into the you know, looking more and more into artificial intelligence and we'll have things like, you know, for example, DeepMind's AlphaGo program and things like that. What, how would that work in a different way? Or could it generalize more if it actually had these other more holistic drivers going into it? Because it's really looking at a very, um, you know, simplified model of the world in that case. But humans are dealing with, a lot of different things which they're constantly having to adapt to. And so one of the roles of emotion is, is actually a, it's survival. It's like we're adapting sure. to the, these different the, situations the coming. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's all about as, as um, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting off, off track to your question, but the, these, these give you an idea is that, so, so the different things, um, the reason that I'm interested in building these models into, into Baby X is really it's, a, it's an exploration of how do these things fit together. It's also to make people aware. It's we take our bodies and our minds totally for granted that there's a biological system in there which is, which is doing all this wonderful stuff. But in a way, by presenting this to people, even if it's completely simplified, um, it nevertheless makes people more um, aware of the wonder of themselves. Mm. So that's one of the one of the you know other things which is you know really interesting there. So another reason for doing um, you know essentially the Baby X project is that we can use it to explore different things. Like for example, we're doing a um, uh, experience I'm, I'm collaborating with a developmental psychologist in at Henderson and we're we're building essentially um, developmental psychology experiments which where we actually are wanting to use baby X as a scientific control in those experiments because we can look at how a caregiver interacts with a you know young child or infant or toddler or you know sort of around the two-year-old with 18 months, two-year-old age, and we can look at the mechanics of that human relationship 
And what does a successful relationship involve? How is it repaired when it goes wrong? How do we teach these fundamental things? So by having a digital baby that looks like a real baby and is responding in these human-like ways, it now gives us a way to really explore those types of human dyadic interactions in a way which has never been possible before. So, for example, we could change the eye gaze of the baby or the baby or the emotional state of the baby and just see what the parent does. So, so what we're trying to do is actually create a Turing test for early behavior. Now, why is that important? Because early behavior is, sets the foundations of social learning. It's how we cooperate with each other, it's how we communicate, all these different things. The foundations there, and I think that for the future of artificial intelligence, the foundation of interaction, we have it. We all experience it as, as you know, babies and infants and toddlers. We experience all of that. We're bathed in that. And that affects how we do things later on. And so these fundamentals of the way that we interact and why it becomes so easy to interact with other people as adults, which then enables cooperation, which and cooperation is the most powerful force in history. So if we're going to create machines that we can cooperate with, then we want to look at the human principles of cooperation. And then that involves all kinds of things. It's like modeling the other person's intent. You know, so you have toddlers that are able to figure out that an adult wants to open a box or go out a door. And so by building machines which are trying to think more in a human type of way, then they become more relatable and more easy to work with. And so this is another reason for doing it. So it's mm. actually a... Um, and this kind of comes back to, you know, your original sort of question is, is I'm interested in how all of these factors come together because I, I think that they all matter. I think that, you know, understanding our nature is, is critical, understanding the role of emotion, cognition, how these things interplay, understanding how this impacts future technology, all of these things, it's all holistic. Mm. Um, and and that's that's why I think it has to be approached in a in a very human like way because we're building the future that um you know that that we will be interacting with. So you know. I, have a, I have a few reactions. One is um, when I was working on empathy and AI in my book, the very idea of trying to encode it means you have to understand it. You have to at least to try to understand what it is in order before you start writing it. And then, oh, well, why are you trying to encode empathy into AI? And I think it brings up existential questions in a similar kind of way. So, so I want to um, first say that I think you can only do this in a limited way. Like, I do not believe that you will ever be able to make a machine which can understand human suffering without living a human life. So you could have a machine read all the novels of the world, but its response might be very sympathetic. However, it's really an ontology at work, and you know that it has no grounding in its actual experience. Sure. And, and the only way to actually you know, fully understand human suffering is a full natural life. So and... And because because you because it's like to be truly empathetic, you have gone through those things, so you can directly relate it. And and it's a high dimensional thing. So for example, um, you know, yes, I can be empathetic if I see somebody looking sad, but I don't know the reason for that. However, if it's somebody that I know really well, and I know that their parents just died or something like that, then I understand the context within their emotion is being felt and that is the empathetic construction because you have you're then going okay there's this you know they're physiologically feeling terrible but they're also psychologically feeling like everything about their life is now sort of collapsed in that way and also their entire sense of history you know if their parents died then it's you know that that's the person that brought them into the world now for a machine to understand all of those things they kind of 
you know, it, it kind of has to go through it. And even if, but like I said, even if that was done from books or from, from Wikipedia or whatever, you will, because the machine hasn't been there, then you can only relate on a surface level. Now, that's not to say that you can't approach it at a higher level. So the machine could say something like, you know, I've never experienced it myself, but I imagine that this must be deeply upsetting. Now, at that point, it's disclaiming essentially that it has that experience. And I think that that's the right level to deal with this mm -hmm. because because it's not you're not claiming human intelligence you're not claiming human emotion you're what you're doing is you're 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 sort of um i guess i guess it's like it's a it seems to me that this would be the case right but i mean unless, unless you have lost your parents you don't know what it's like either you're coming to your friend and and the at some level in the story of empathy it is the observers right to believe that the other is being empathic or not it, that, that let's say if i tell you some horrible thing it's you obviously would imagine it's horrible but you didn't go through that exact same horrible thing so you but, can't but know i it. think that's a yes but i think that's the case in human relationships too right i think it's very i think a human like unless say you've lost your parents you can't be fully empathetic to that until it happens to you and i think that's one of the things is as we go through life um, we become more empathetic uh, in gen most people because because and we become humbled and we become all this stuff because we actually like you know life basically takes its toll on everybody you've and, accumulated experiences yeah and it's also you know like if you've if, for example um, experiencing the birth of a child nothing can prepare you to that for that you know that is something which you can read all the books, you can be told everything about it, but until you actually experience that and and then, you know, having children in those ways, that that is something which is, is not part of your experience. So this comes back down to grounding of of knowledge. So it's like the and one of the other interesting sort of factors of like but with with building like something like Baby X, it's like if you can build a machine which can experience things, then it can then relate back to those particular experiences. So one of the things which we were really trying to explore is experiential learning, which, and this is one of my favorite parts of this, is because we go down the whole road of memory. So, you know, we're building models of episodic memory, you know, implicit memory, all these types of things. And they're very simplistic compared to the real thing. And again, we still don't sure. even know what the real thing is. However, it's so fascinating to you know, when you start really digging into the nature of these, how these memories would work, even on an engineering level, because, you know, our sense of our lives is just our memory. And and we have, I mean, it's our memory and our interaction at the at the moment, right? So it's our, it's our sort of current environment. But then if we're musing over something, if we're dreaming or whatever, that's just memories at play. And and, um, you know, so then when you're going to, well, how will we build the memories of the machines of the future? And then how will we relate to them? So what I see is really interesting is that, so talking about empathy, one of the, so empathy, you know, we're having, we have that shared experience, but we can still have, um, you know, and some of the most rewarding conversations we have as humans are with people that have had totally different life experiences to us. We will never know what it's like. Like I'll never know what it's like to be a rock star, for example. However, you know, it'd be fantastic to talk to a rock star to just get a fit, an idea of what that's like. And you know, I can't ever know that for real, but I can at least it sort of like expands my imagination. Now, um, so so then I think with machines of the future, by making them more human relatable, we will be able to have those sorts of discussions. So if a machine, you know, has its, you know, digital brain basically completely wired into the internet and it's experiencing all these different things at any one time, you can ask it what that was like. 
And, you know, like, for example, say that you experience one of these global events where the internet, you know, everything just circles. That, that is something where the machine is having a, an experience that a human can't have. And those conversations, I think, are going to be the things which really transcend where we're at at the moment because we really, but we, for us to understand them, we have to be able to map that into something that can relate to us. So, you know, I might not be um, a rock star, but a rock star could say, well, you know, it feels like this. You know, when I go out on stage, it kind of feels like, you know, um, uh, you know, jumping into the ocean or something like that, where where you're going, it, I, you're, you're mapping it onto some experiential quality that the other person might have experienced. And so a lot of our experience is building up at the very start from physical interaction with the world. And so a lot of our words and, and things like that are actually mapping to um, to the physicality of the world, touch, um, uh, sense, all these different types of things, we map that to, to language. So even if I talk, the gestures that I make with my hands are often something to do with the physical nature of the world. So then when a word comes along or when somebody's talking, we're mapping it back to this sensory motor experience that we've had early on, like if, or mapping it to a physiological experience, you know, or how did you feel when that happened? So, one of the things that strikes me in your work is that you are intent on recreating, at least the best I can understand it, things that are going on in our brain. And, and so you're looking to make where, where the amygdala works in, in the way you visualize it. You have the amygdala firing off and, and then the neurons in the different parts of the brain connecting in in models that presumably are your best understanding of what's going on in the brain my question is to what extent do you think trying to be real is vivifying or limiting and if i were to take the example of go where you don't teach the machine the rules you teach the machines what you're trying to do it seems to me that trying to copy the the physical components that you were just talking about into the brain and and modeling around what is biologically there is is a is a is a way but it's maybe there are other ways how how do you react to that thought well there's only one template of general intelligence and that's us there's only one working template i can have a machine that plays go and it can figure out some rules is it generally intelligent no could it make a cup of coffee? No, it couldn't do anything else. So the thing is, in those games, I mean, there's very clever algorithms which have figured out how to minimize an objective function. Now, yes, that's that's great. And so then the problem becomes, okay, well, let's minimize these objective functions across all the modalities. And then they have to be coordinated. Oh, when should I be playing Go versus... Um, you know, mowing the lawn. You know, this is what people do all the time. So we are constantly working out from all of these different things what to do. And so to me, where the current state of AI is basically, yeah, really good at doing essentially, it's very narrow AI, everything's narrow. It's all basically focused on doing certain tasks really, really well. The algorithms which do those tasks really, really well, may well be general enough to do all kinds of things, but you still have to coordinate those. Now, our embodiment, our physiology, is controlling how all of those components work. We've got incredibly good visual system. We've got incredibly good auditory system. We can do all kinds of things. We can bring up memories at will. We can do all kinds of stuff. How does that all get coordinated? And so that's what we're really trying to build is a is a artificial nervous system, which can interact with all these components. Like for example, on Baby X, I could plug in, you know, one of the deep mind reasoning systems into that, and you know, Baby X would be able to figure out how to play any game. 
but then that would still be coordinated with all the social interactions because baby X is a social agent. So I have a, and this is where I think the, the key thing that, you know, I guess as a company that we're, we're going towards is how do you create social agents which interact with artificial intelligence at scale? Because we, at some point, you have to interact with these systems and these systems are going to be extremely powerful, but you have to work with them on multiple levels. Now, it's okay to be a computer scientist or an engineer, data scientist, whatever, interacting with these systems. But for the general person out there, they want something that they can relate to. And how are they going to relate to essentially a black box algorithm? And even if that's explainable AI, how are they going to relate to it? Once that machine can express itself in human terms that another person from a completely different walk of life can understand, that is when people will trust it. It's amazing what you when I see people interacting with computers and and attributing to the computer personality and and things and and even the 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 awakening of Eliza and it, how it started with this Rogerian approach it made people feel that they were listened to and and even if it's you know just horrible cursors and text on a screen these individuals started feeling like they had a relationship with that little machine at least possibly I I, I like to think that they had more of a relationship than they have with their human beings around them. And and in comparison to the lack of listening that so many of us no longer have the ability to do today, a machine that can do it is that's a beautiful thing. So people, are, people have, um, you know, people, so this is, they brought up lots of fantastic points there. So A, people are constantly projecting their consciousness onto inanimate objects. So children do this all the time. If they pick up a stick or a cardboard box, you know, the stick becomes a princess or something like that. And so so it's in our nature to project consciousness onto other things. We're constantly projecting consciousness onto other people and also onto inanimate objects. Like, for example, you may love your car or you may mm. love your, you know, Stradivarius or whatever it is. And And the thing is, is your relationship is the time that you spend with it and it's the emotions which are elicited during that time so for example if you love your car you may go and sort of you know just admire its shininess or something like that and run your hands across it and all these things are a physical and you will be experiencing emotion during that thing even though the car is an inanimate object and so you do have a relationship with your car. If the car is destroyed in an accident, people are genuinely upset if that's something that they really liked. You know, some people get upset, you know, like if your house burns down, that's a relationship that you have with that. So people will get very upset. Now, you can even say, um, you know, say if your house gets down, uh, burnt down and there's photographs in that. Those are physical things. However, they are memory encodings. So your life... And your relationship with that object, even if it's inanimate, has created a set of memories. So because it's created a set of memories, it has emotional meaning to you, no matter whether it's animate or inanimate. So I think we're always creating relationships. And I think that, you know, with your example of, you know, the Eliza, in a way, you know, Eliza, yeah, Eliza is that program, um, even though it's just doing, you know, these sort of predictable or repetitive responses well hopefully your car is a bit predictable and and repetitive otherwise it would be a you know a little bit scary to drive so so there is a relationship form there and it, and it may be a source of comfort back you know, to your you might point just like back to the point at the beginning it's the reliability that's the trustworthiness i want to just spend a little bit of time on, on last area which is when you're working on Baby X, you, you talk about injecting more cortisol or, or different hormones which create or model, I would suppose, certain behaviors. And 
when you want to make human, though, we have chaos, which we've talked about a number of times in the sort of a chaotic world. The human's ability to react isn't always programmable. We have certain things you, you're pretty aware. If I did a big clap, oh, that's going to scare me. All right, for many, that will scare. But other people might react differently. And all of a sudden, it's a probability story. When you are doing your, your modeling and you're working with businesses, because I know you're trying to work with businesses, how do you imagine the idea of injecting chaos into your baby? Or yes, that's that's a that's a that's a great question. So, the basically, in it, with working with the business, so people there's multiple things going on here. People are fundamentally interested in uncertainty. Right. It's one of the reasons why we find things engaging is because we want to see what happens next. This is why we get so engrossed in books and movies. What's going to happen next? When you have a degree of that chaos, if you like, in an interaction, it's absolutely fascinating. What's going to happen next? And also you're co-creating what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're an observer. You're a participant. And so when you become a participant, it's much more engaging. So that's on one level. However, if we're working with a bank, for example, um, we want that to be predictable. I'm sure the bank wants the responses to be predictable. So you can think of this as a, a an actor who's either doing working closely to a script or improvising. <laughs> and the actor working closely to a script is doing a, it's a very defined and it's deliberately defined and predictable. And so you could, you know, somebody working in a, in a, um, in a particular industry may have a set of things that they need to do. Like for example, a nurse will have an algorithm to triage patients, you know, are they breathing, you know, can they stand up all that sort of stuff. And they're, they're literally going through a set of, of, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a processes, procedure, yeah. that they, process, processes. So then on the other hand, um, you know, a lot of entertainment, interesting stuff, if we're having a conversation, you know, they can go off on all different angles and we actually value them for that. So, you know, say if you had a games character, then you'd probably want that really autonomous because it makes it way more interesting. It's creating this sort of interactive world. And if you have a banking assistant, you want that much more predictable. However, the things that we really enjoy uh, somewhere in the middle. We like a degree of predictability and a de degree of unpredictability. So, for example, if how I'm interacting with the bank assistant has a has a sort of degree of, of other things going on there, it's still staying on, on task. But you can kind of move it around. You can shape it a bit. Then it becomes, you, you become more in control of the experience in a way. So you, you, your, your participation is actually creating a richer experience. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons, I mean, people like going to um, a grocery store because they might like speaking to the grocer. They are actually there to buy vegetables, but they're actually there for also for an interaction. And, and you know, the, this is the, yeah, so there's many, many sort of elements like that. And so it's really... Um, incredibly application dependent. Mm. For example, if I have an entertainer, I want the entertainer as autonomous as possible. If I have a doctor, I want the doctor doing everything exactly um, so that it's it's completely accountable. And to the point you were making at the beginning of evaluating caregivers with a 18 month year old, there would, in any event, at this point, we would be very focused on specific tasks on specific moments because as we go down garden paths of conversations it just can be too many so you you need to formulate cases or scenarios that are quite specific to that one well one one of the things that we're working on at the moment is is a language teacher so that's something where you need you need there's lots and lots of human feedback going on in that so, so it's, a, it's not a teacher, a tutor. So it's something that is a, you know, can help people sort of, you know, practice their homework, if you like. And so that's something where you, you because 
language is inherently used to speak to another person, the best way to practice that is actually with a digital human that is available whenever you feel like practicing. And then you go out and talk to a real person when you're confident enough. So it's kind of like, but that's a, that's a particular case where where you want as human-like reactions to things, and 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 because you're you're in, in a way you're preparing for the real world. Are you doing a specific you know, language? Are you using Maori? <laughs> um, actually, that's our first project. Is that and it so? Is? But the way that we're approaching it is general. It can work on any language. So, uh, but you still need to figure out all the languages. Listen, uh, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on and, and chatting about this. It's, it's, uh, we're, we are at the frontier. There is a sense of, as we're discussing this, I can feel at the, how the frontier and peering into the future. That's what I feel like I was doing listening to you, Mark. So how can anybody track you down, uh, follow you as you wish, or at least explore what you're working on? Well, we have a, a website, um, soulmachines.com that doesn't really talk about a lot of the the research work that's really just mainly focused on the on the business aspect of the company um you know i do various talks and there's things on youtube um uh uh baby x at the moment is is uh, undergoing a um uh, uh we're redeveloping certain parts parts of baby x so that um so uh, baby X will probably make a uh, another surfacing in uh, next year. A Cog X so, in London. Uh, oh, maybe. So, um, so uh, you know. Oh, actually, one of the other things which I, I did want to talk about there too is is that I think machines can be creative, and mm. I think there's a creative loop. And so, one of the things I'm most interested in with Baby X is actually uh, building a creative machine, the one that can play like a child. And and so those are things which I think are just you know really fascinating, and mm -hmm. they essentially create um, knowledge and experience and art and things like that. And these things will, you know, that again, it's not human; it's something different. But it's it's nevertheless going into really interesting areas. No doubt. So um, it's like the X factor; it's the the moment that the sperm creates life. And that creativity at that moment, how do, how do we make that sort of spark that then becomes so much more afterwards? Yeah, exactly. It's like a, um, in a way, you know, because people sometimes think about science as reductionist, but, the you know, this is more like, you know, systems biology where basically you're looking at the interaction of so many different pieces and, you know, both in in sort of integrative um, science and and you know much more reductionist science, the deeper we go, the deeper the mystery becomes. And you know, it's, it's such a fantastic journey that we all experience. You know, trying to delve into these mysteries of life, and you know, uh, I'm pretty sure we're uh, we're still going to be delving into these mysteries a thousand years in the future. But it's a um, a, uh, uh, it's it's the the more that we understand how we relate to one another and relate to the technology that we're creating, the more harmonious we can make it. So um, we have to be we have to be thinking about it. We have to be asking the difficult ethical questions. We have to be all of these things are things which are incredibly important. Like for, for our company, ethics is an extremely important part of the of what of we're doing. We want to make sure that everything that we're doing has a socially positive consequence. And so so you know it it, it all matters because ultimately um, you know yes we want to build systems that people trust. The intention is there. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Minta. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on MinterDial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason and let me show you why I'm a convinced man practicing my line 